still morning? So we have two handouts today. One uh, has some of the poetry Bonhoeffer wrote when he was in prison. Uh, the first one uh, we heard last week in the presentation, Who Am I? Um, and then there's a second one called The Death of Moses, uh, which uh, I will read later in the presentation. Uh, and then uh, the last one is uh, von Gutenmechten, um, Powers of Good or by Gracious Powers or by Gentle Powers. That's what you heard playing in the background, and that's what our hymn throughout Lent uh, is, is based on, that Bonhoeffer wrote uh, at the end of 1944. And then we also have another sheet. Uh, today we're talking about Bonhoeffer's thought and theology, and uh, Near the end of the war, in Bonhoeffer's letters, he writes about a world come of age and a religionless Christianity, um, which I'll talk about later, uh, near the end of today's presentation. But this uh, gives some, uh, some guidelines about th those thoughts. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty deep. It's probably the most dense part of what we're talking about today. So this helps outline some of that and see some of what he had to say along those lines. So uh, Bonhoeffer, um, as I talked about before, has been memorialized in, in many different places, including at Westminster Abbey, uh, where, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, uh, they built these niches of 20th century saints. And Bonhoeffer is there uh, with Dr. King and Oscar Romero uh, and others. So as I said, today we're talking about Bonhoeffer's theology and thought. So like anyone, he had uh, theological influences. Uh, he comes out of this uh, German liberal school of theology, and he's reacting against that. Uh, just as we react against our parents, Bonhoeffer is reacting against his theological parents. Uh, but he ends up kind of placing himself in the middle between his current generation's uh, form of theology called neo-orthodoxy, which I'll talk about in a minute, and the kind of German liberal theologians he learned under in Berlin. So Adolf von Harnock um, was one of his teachers at the University of Berlin. So he, he traced the history, the chronology of dogma within the Christian church. Um, as it says, from the fourth century to the Reformation. And he he addressed the connection of Christianity or Christian faith and Greek philosophy. Um, and he said that they were so melded together um, that many so-called Christian beliefs aren't authentically Christian because they are so informed by Greek philosophy. He denied the possibility of miracles, but argued that Jesus may have done things um, like healings that seemed miraculous. Uh, Bonhoeffer will reject most of what Harnock teaches, um, although, as it says, he was impressed by his passion for truth and his integrity. Karl Hull, um, very much a Lutheran theologian, um, he helped bring about this Luther Renaissance. So um, it, it would have been the two... 375th anniversary of the Reformation, Hull is really one of the central theologians returning this emphasis back on Luther. He emphasizes justification of faith. So this is Reinhold Seberg. Uh, he was Bonhoeffer's dissertation advisor, um, and he was really all over the place. So historical theology, early Christianity, Luther, Dun Scotus, who is an early Scottish saint. He was a nationalist, but a nationalist before, 
a World War I type nationalist. So a lot of these German liberal theologians were very much in support of Germany in World War I. Um, this idea of more Lebensraum or living space for Germany. Uh, he, saw, he saw the German Empire as central in, to the salvation of the war. And I emphasize empire as opposed to the Weimar Republic. Um, and he was close to the Kaiser as well. However, he emphasized the social nature of the church and the social gospel. So obviously that has an impact on Bonhoeffer and that's probably where Bonhoeffer's connection of, of those in church ethics comes from. So Bart, uh, Karl Bart was a Swiss reform theologian um, depending who you talk to, one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century. Bonhoeffer and Barth uh, were friends. Uh, they were often exchanging theological ideas. Much of what Bonhoeffer writes is in response to Barth. Uh, they don't agree on everything, but they definitely are in the same school of thought. Um, and Barth... Um, very, very opinionated. He knew that he was known as the greatest theologian, and he uh, he he didn't bother to tell anyone if he, if uh, he thought that they were really on the wrong track. And he certainly would tell Bonhoeffer that, um, including when Bonhoeffer went to go pastor churches in London. Bart said, "What the heck are you doing, leaving Germany right now? We need you there." And then um, when Bonhoeffer was doing all this traveling during the war as this double agent in Alvear, of course, Bart had no idea about that, but he challenges, why and how are you able to do all this travel when none of the rest of us are doing? He was, he was very concerned that Bonhoeffer had gone to the other side. So they had this very interesting back and forth uh, relationship. So, um, as I said, they both reject the 19th century's liberal theology with its focus on human religion. Bart has this emphasis on the theology of grace revealed in Jesus Christ as the word of God, uh, rather than revelation coming from uh, nature. Um, so Bonhoeffer early on critiques Bart for interpreting God's freedom as freedom from the world rather than freedom for the world, freedom to uh, be with the community of the world. Um, he works to recover the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, and then Bart's view of salvation is based on Christ. It's Christological, so Christology is uh, the study of Christ or what we believe about Christ. Um, stating that in Jesus Christ, the reconciliation of all mankind has already taken place and that through Christ, uh, humans are already elect and justified. So that's kind of uh, basic Bart, and Bart was just absolutely prolific. Sanctorum Communio is uh, Bonhoeffer's first dissertation and his first book. It means the communion of saints. It is uh, very, very dense. Um, it reads like a doctoral dissertation. Um, so uh, he publishes, he write, completes it at age 21. He publishes it in 1930. Um, the concept of person in ethical relation to the other. Uh, so again, going back to Bart's idea of God's freedom, Christian freedom is being free for the other, not being free from others. So the reciprocal relationship of persons and community. Uh, and he deals with that from an anthropological uh, perspective. So um, a couple of pieces from, from his uh, dissertation. The nature of the church can only be understood from within, from era et studio, meaning with passionate zeal, never by non-participants, only those who take the claim of the church seriously 
not relativizing it in relation to the other, similar claims of their own rationality, but viewing it from the standpoint of the gospel can possibly glimpse something of its true nature. So uh, Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer takes the topic of sin very seriously uh, in his writings. He has later lectures called Creation and Fall, uh, which uh, deals with it uh, more head on. But he talks about the original creation at the very beginning, rooted in perfect love uh, between the relationship between the creator and the creation. And then sin, however, sin comes into the world, it replaces love with selfishness. This gave rise to the break in immediate community with God and likewise in human community. And that's permeated society. And so the role of the Christian community, he says, is to demonstrate that true love is about and where the solution to this broken community can be found, namely in the cross of Christ. So it's the role of Christian community to constantly be pointing to the cross as the place uh, where that is reconciled. So Bonhoeffer has, has a very high Christology all through his writing. The church is the presence of Christ in the same way that Christ is the presence of God. So Bonhoeffer clearly believes that the church is the visible presence of Christ in the world. Um, in other words, how we talk about the body of Christ. So uh, the Christian community cannot be understood in itself, but only in a historical dialectic. The concept is split within itself. Its inner history can be seen in the concepts of primal state. So when he says primal state, he means at the very beginning, or as Genesis would tell us, in creation, sin, so what happens after creation, and then the revelation which comes through Jesus Christ. So he talks um, what Christian love means. So he sees Christian love as not a human possibility without Christ, uh, that it's only possible through faith in Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, love is purposeful. Um, it loves the real neighbor, so the neighbor as they really are and not this ideal concept, and that Christian love knows no limits. So Sanctorum Communio, and, and this is a book that was recently uh, written about it, and um, Bonhoeffer's dissertations really have, have been overlooked, partly because they are so dense and so difficult to understand, um, but Michael Mawson has said that it's an attempt to wrestle through how we understand the church as the place of God's revelation, uh, even though it has limits and failures. So again, it goes back to primal state in the state of sin and reconciliation. These kind of, what Bonhoeffer sees is these kind of three stages. Um, and uh, trying to understand the church apart from those three stages is just abstract or idealistic according to Bonhoeffer. So Act and Being is his second uh, dissertation. Um, you can notice by the subtitle how difficult it is, Transcendental Philosophy and Ontology and Systematic Theology. Uh, I think he needed one more ology in there. Um, so he wrote in 29 to 30 as his second dissertation, so his postdoctoral work, and it deals with questions of consciousness and conscience and theology from the perspective of the Reformation, about the origin of human sinfulness, as he says, the heart turned in upon itself and thus opened neither to the revelation of God nor to the encounter with neighbor. So notice this, the revelation of God in the word is the theme that he continually comes back to again and again. So it's not only my opinion, but uh, Princeton University Press referred to uh, his second dissertation or book as notoriously difficult to understand and virtually inscrutable. <laughs> I have been on page 73 for about two years. Because 
it's very dense, and I put it down and had to step away for, for a while. <laughs> uh, but so here you see Bonhoeffer is in conversation with Bart again. Uh, and as I mentioned before, he critiques Bart's understanding as the freedom of God. Um, and then he says, Christ's unique mode of being uh, is what keeps Christ free from objectification and facilitates Christ's presence in the church. He's confronting two philosophies of transcendentalism and idealism. Uh, I want to say that he says transcendentalism leads to atheism and idealism leads to Marxism. And he calls for an ecclesiastical or ecclesiological form of thinking, thinking as the church. So over and against these two predominant philosophies in the culture of his day. So again, he wants to show that transcendentalism and idealism presuppose views of human nature, which he says are wrong. And he engages the problem of the modern person who tries to reach self-understanding apart from God, especially transcendentalism, and a problem which he struggled with his, his own self. And he says that for Christians, self-understanding comes from hearing the word of God. God is not free from human beings, but God is free for us. Um, so God is not completely independent of us. So this is against that kind of watchmaker theology of God sets, sets the clock in motion and then lets us go. Bonhoeffer really thinks God is much more involved in creation uh, than that. So one quote that's not entirely inscrutable. The person now lives in the contemplation of Christ. This is the gift of faith that one no longer looks upon oneself, but solely upon the salvation that has to come from without. So creation and fall, as I mentioned before, um, it's based on lectures he gave to undergraduates from 32 to 33, and it's based on his notes. Um, so he talks about the church existing in the middle. And what he means by that is that uh, the story of Genesis, whether you take it literally or not, is our trying to figure out or explain what happens at the very beginning. Explained by people who live in the middle of creation. So we don't know what the beginning was like, and we don't know what the end will be like, and so we're trying to find our way in the dark of the middle. Um, and so, but we have this sense that somehow humankind has fallen or committed sin and that it is not as it should be. So there's something broken in creation. And so he sees Genesis uh, as that interpretation. So the creation, the very beginning and the fall of when sin enters our sphere. And he says, only by Christ can we know the beginning because we talk about the word being made flesh of Jesus being at the very beginning um, with the creator God. We cannot place ourselves at the beginning because that is not where we exist. We exist in the middle. We're in the dark trying to figure our way. Um, and it's only by the light of Christ that we can see. So Christian theology seeks to affirm goodness. And Bonhoeffer points out that goodness does not lie in and of itself, but by the work of God. He believes that human beings are free, and again, not free from, but free for the other. Um, the minute you think you have a right to dominate others, you are violating the freedom of others. So again, freedom is a major concept in his theology. Um, he, he observes that blessings are granted to the human, as we see in Genesis, be fruitful and multiply, have dominion and subdue the earth. He sees Genesis as an account from above on God's side that humankind makes the final work of God's self-glorification. Uh, so he's talking about the two different Genesis accounts. There are two different creation stories in Genesis that follow one after another. The second account is about God's nearness to creation. It's a way of talking about God for humankind. 
So he sees that in the beginning, life was not problematic, so creation. And then, um, so God is at the center of that life. Life is in the center, is dependent on God. Um, and the tree uh, in the Garden of Eden is, is the symbol of God being taken out of the center of our lives. The theological question is not a question about the origin of evil, but one about the actual overcoming of evil on the cross. It seeks real forgiveness of guilt and reconciliation of the fallen world. God's work has been created. We have been created for the final peace, for the day of resurrection of Jesus Christ, for the day of the final resurrection, and the rest of the creator with the creatures the creator has made that they may rest from their labor and their works follow them. Once again, being free for the other because I am bound to the other only by being in relationship with the other am I free. The fact that God is free means nothing else that we are free for God. And a last quote from it. The end of Cain's history, so Cain and Abel, Cain killing his brother, leads to Christ on the cross, the last desperate assault on the gate of paradise. The trunk of the cross becomes the wood of life, the tree of life, the cross of Christ, the center of God's world. That is fallen but upheld and preserved. That is what the end of the story about paradise is for us. Now we get to the good stuff. So discipleship or Nachfolge uh, in... In German, or as it's been translated in English, Cost of Discipleship. This was published in 1937. This is a classic of Christian literature. Uh, it's been read by millions of people, and he wrote it while he was leading his illegal seminary in Pomerania at Finkenwalde. And so, as, as we mentioned last week, they have this, essentially, what is a Protestant monastic community and so he's reflecting on what discipleship really means in that time where he's training these ministers illegally, but also while the church is still struggling on how do they address the Third Reich. He does not directly address or, or mention what is going on with Hitler and the Nazi party and everything else, but it's, it's all in the subtext. Much like the Bible. Yes. <laughs> so he, as I've mentioned before, he's interpreting the Sermon on the Mount for everyday life. Like I mentioned last week, there's this Lutheran, there is an old Lutheran idea of what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount is so difficult that it really just points to our sinful nature of how difficult it is for us to follow. Bonhoeffer says, no, that's wrong. Jesus really wants us to do what he says to do uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about cheap grace and costly grace. So Bonhoeffer, like most Christians, believes that grace is free, that grace calls us to discipleship, as the, as the title of the book would indicate. Um, he may have learned this concept of cheap grace from Adam Clayton Powell, who's the pastor of the African American Church in Harlem in New York, where he attended when he was in fellowship at, at, at Union Seminary. So this is what he says, and you saw some of this last week. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living incarnate. So he's really responding to this sense of positive Christianity that has little requirement for discipleship. But also remember, he is ordained in a state church where you do weddings for everyone whether they're all technically members of your 1,000 to 5,000 member parish, but do you see them on Sundays? No, of course not. And you're doing baptism and confirmation for all of those same people without 
requiring discipleship from them. So from my perspective, that's where he's, he's writing from. So costly grace on the opposite side of that. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again and again, the gift of which must be asked for, the door at which man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin, and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. Yea, ye were born, bought at a price, and what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. So Bonhoeffer deals with the issue of sin and grace in, in both hands. Um, he's not afraid to deal with, with those issues. And we in the mainland kind of shy away from one part of that. So um, he talked, so in discipleship, he talks about monasticism as the faithful remnant for much of the church's history. So people who go into the religious orders, monks and nuns, um, set aside uh, for, for much of Christian history. It was pointed, well, again, it's, it's just so hard to follow Jesus, but the monks and nuns are doing it for us, so it's okay that, that we're not really doing the thing. Um, so Bonhoeffer says monasticism was represented as an individual achievement which the mass of laity could not be expected to emulate. The commandments of Jesus were limited to a restricted group of specialists and a double standard arose, a maximum and a minimum standard of church obedience. So the monks and nuns were at the maximum level and then everyday laity church members were at this minimum level. And Bonhoeffer sees this as kind of this great problem in the history of the church. And so it leads to this lower standard for the rest of us, as long as we can point to those in religious orders and saying, well, they're doing it for us. So Bonhoeffer says, the price we are having to pay today in the shape of the collapse of the organized church is only the inevitable consequence of our policy of making grace available to all at too low a cost. We gave away the word and sacraments wholesale. We baptized, confirmed, and absolved a whole nation without condition. And I think he's reflecting directly on the state church model there. Our humanitarian sentiment made us give that which was holy to the scornful and unbelieving, but the call to follow Jesus in the narrow way was hardly ever heard. So it's not people's fault and they go to the minimum because they have not heard this narrow way preached from the pulpit. Luther, Bonhoeffer says, Luther said that grace alone can save. His followers took up his doctrine and repeated it word for word, but they left out its invariable corollary, the obligation of discipleship. So some other points from discipleship. So the body of Christ is the ground of salvation. He says, had Jesus been merely a prophet or teacher, he would not have needed followers, only pupils and hearers. How do we participate in the body of Christ? Bonhoeffer says, through the sacraments of his body, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Um, since the ascension, Christ's place on earth has been taken by his taken place by his body, the church. Again, Bonhoeffer sees Christ existing on earth as the church. And we should think of the church not as an institution, but as a person, the person of Jesus Christ. So he has seven principles of discipleship. So there's no road to faith or discipleship, no other road, only obedience to the call of Jesus Christ. 
And because Jesus is the Christ, he has the authority to call and demand obedience. And beside Jesus, nothing has significance. He alone matters. Then he argues that discipleship is not an abstract idea. It's not a doctrine. It's a personal relationship. Um, with an abstract idea, it's possible to enter into a relation of formal knowledge, to become enthusiastic about it, even to put it in practice, but it can never be followed in personal obedience. It has to be a concrete relationship. He's saying it requires faith and obedience. They cannot be separated. Only he who believes is obedience, and only he who is obedient believes. And he's pretty critical here. No one wants to know about your faith or unbelief. Your orders are to perform the act of obedience on the spot. Then you will find yourself in the situation where faith becomes possible and faith exists in the true sense of the word. So he says, nothing could be more ruthless than to make men think there's still plenty of time to mend their ways. To tell men that their cause is urgent and that the kingdom of God is at hand is the most charitable and merciful act we can perform, the most joyous news we can bring. Discipleship never consists in this or that specific action. It's always a decision either for or against Jesus. Christ speaks to us exactly as he spoke to them. It was not as though they first recognized him as the Christ and then received his command. They believed his word and command and recognized him as the Christ in that order. Being a Christian is less about cautiously avoiding sin than about courageously and actively doing God's will. Bonhoeffer says that... Um, Action comes not from thought, but readiness for responsibility. So he is, he's really tired of this theorizing and um, theology that is not practical. He wants a theology that, that is lived in your everyday experience. So life together, um, this is only about 120 pages uh, it's really, really rich. Um, it's published in 38. Uh, he's writing it while he's still leading the illegal seminary, and it's his um, reflection on the kind of community that they have created. Um, and once again, you see Christ is central, Christ existing in community, Christ is the church, and the church is the community of love. And he says any congregation, any church community will remain sound and healthy only where it does not form itself into a movement or an order or a society or a collegium pietatis, which is um, kind of a pious community or a communion of uh, pietous people, but rather where it understands itself as part of the one holy Catholic Christian church. So... Every congregation needs to understand itself as part of the universal Christian church throughout the world. It is not separate. Um, it is not the church that has it right over and above everyone else in the Christian community. Do you get the feeling that good theologians wait for other theologians and not for the... Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You definitely see that in his early work when he's writing to his professors. Life together and cost of discipleship, there's certainly some thick stuff in there, um, but it's much more accessible. And there's a reason that those two have become uh, spiritual classics. I have a friend who his entire church is reading Life Together, and it's probably the easiest to read of, of what he's written for, for the layperson um, and it's and it's very practical. He orders out, um, we'll get to in a moment, the, the day together with the community, what that should look like, and what your day alone as a Christian should look like. Um, 
But he says, Jesus Christ lived in the midst of his enemies. At the end, all his disciples deserted him. On the cross, he was utterly alone, surrounded by evildoers and mockers. For this cause, he had come to bring peace to the enemies of God. So the Christian, too, belongs not in the seclusion of a cloistered life, but in the thick of foes. There is his commission, his work. The kingdom is to be in the midst of your enemies, and he who will not suffer this does not want to be of the kingdom of Christ. He wants to be among friends, to sit among roses and lilies, not with the bad people, but the devout people. So even though Bonhoeffer has established the pseudo-monastic community, um, he sees that cloistered life, life in the monastery or convent as not what we're called to. We're called to be out in community. So we have these same practices spiritually, but we're called to be with people outside the church. Well, even within the church, people that you know, think differently than you do. Right. Even. I mean, I think about like the Wednesday night group. We're not there to be a group of people who all think the same way and exactly. therefore we sit there and pat each other on the back mm -hmm. we're there to share where we are and what we think and accept everybody where they are and share what we think yeah and it's Absolutely. hard to do you kind of like to have a group where everybody thinks the same and nobody can flip yeah in and, way, and he talked about this idealist about. vision of what community should look like um, and that not being what God wants. God wants us to live into the reality of community and its difficulties and its messiness. Um, and so the implication is that when the church gets difficult, when we get into conflicts and disagreements as is inevitable, as has happened since the year 33, that it's, it's not the church being unfaithful. That is just what happens when humans are in community together and we have to work through, it, through those things. So he says, if my sinfulness appears to me to be in any way smaller or less detestable in comparison with the sin of others, I am still not recognizing my sinfulness at all. How can I possibly serve another person in unfeigned humility if I seriously regard his sinfulness as worse than my own? Mm -hmm. So a log out of your own mind. So... If we do not give thanks daily for the Christian fellowship in which we have placed, even where there is no great experience, no discoverable riches, but much weakness, small faith, and difficulty, if on the contrary we only keep complaining to God that everything is so paltry and petty, so far from what we expected, then we hinder God from letting our fellowship grow according to the measure and riches which are there for us all in Jesus Christ. So if all we do is complain about the church, church ain't going to get better. Um, so this is why people leave the church or people don't come into the church. Well, he's talking about people within the church. So if all you do is complain about the congregation you're in, um, or if you do not give thanks, so if you're not praying for your Christian community, um, even though you're not experiencing all these riches or you're just experiencing weakness, if you're not praying for it, um, it's, it's not going to develop and grow anyway. So it's this call to be, to be in prayer and thanksgiving daily for the congregations that we've been placed in. So as I mentioned, the person who loves their dream of community will destroy community, but the person who loves those around them will create community. So again, it's this ideal versus the reality of loving the people who God has called into your community rather than this ideal in your mind of what it should be. Now, uh, a pastor should not complain about his congregation. <laughs> Certainly never to other people, but also not to God. A congregation has not been entrusted to him in order that he should become its accuser before God and men. When a person becomes alienated from a Christian community in which he has been placed and begins to raise complaints about it, 
he had better examine himself first to see whether the trouble is not due to his wish dream that should be shattered by God. And if this be the case, let him thank God for leading him into this predicament. But if not, let him nevertheless guard against ever becoming an accuser of the congregation before God. Let him rather accuse himself for his unbelief. Let him pray God for an understanding of his own failure and his particular sin and pray that he may not wrong his brethren. Let him, in the consciousness of his own guilt, make intercession for his brethren. Let him do what he is committed to do and thank God. So that's the conviction on my heart. Um, so Bonhoeffer is, is not easy on either side of the aisle. So this is how he orders most of the book. So um, he talks about what the day together should look like when you're gathered in community. So um, he talks about re, uh, recovering the gift of the Psalms, and that you should always um, recite the Psalms together, be reading scriptures singing hymns with one another, um, saying prayers, having table fellowship, whether it is communion or whether it is sharing a meal together. And then once you have done those things together, then you can go about the work of the community together. When we're alone, he says we should be in solitude and silence first, then meditation and prayer, and then intercession, so praying for others. He talks about different modes of ministry, holding one's tongue, being meek, listening, helpfulness, bearing each other, proclaiming the word, and showing authority. Could you say something more about the last one? What, what does sure. that mean? <laughs> um, so being responsible for the community that's gathered um, and uh, being responsible for uh, church discipline, how the community orders its life together. So um, being willing to be a leader might be... Yeah, certainly. Important. Showing leadership and vision for the community. Uh, a few last quotes from Life Together. When the morning mists of dream vanish... Then dawns the bright day of Christian fellowship. So that's when he talks about the beginning of the day together as the gathered community. If a Christian is in the fellowship of confession with a brother, he will never be alone again anywhere. It is the voice of the church that is heard in singing together. It is not you that sings, it is the church that is singing together. And you, as a member of the church, may share in its song. And there's a difference between church with a big C and a small C. So big C is the church universal throughout the world, gathered as the body of, of Christ, versus small C church, which is a local congregation. Self-justification and judging others go together as justification by grace and serving others go together. It is grace, nothing but grace, that we are allowed to live in community with Christian brethren. So lastly, again, the centrality of Christ for Bonhoeffer, it's the binding force of the community, allowing us to go beyond superficial and self-centered relationships to a more intimate sense of what it means to be Christ for others and to love others as Christ has loved us. Um, so his entire approach to community life um, that he developed in Fink and Valda comes from a strong faith in the action of Christ in word, sacrament, intercessory prayer, and service that it makes possible for Christians to be with one another. So ethics, um, this was incomplete. He was working on this 1940 to 43. Um, his friend and confidant, Eberhard Betke, um, gathered up all of his papers from this um, and, and published it in 1949. It was intended to be his magnum opus, 
Um, the order of everything is not clear, what order he wanted things placed in. There are three different editions, and everything is placed in different places in different editions. So we're not really sure what he wanted to follow each other. But it's written out of when he was a double agent for the Ogver, for the foreign intelligence. Um, so he, he is at the same time working out his own personal ethics of being involved in a assassination plot against Hitler. Um, so, so again, this was very practical uh, for Bonhoeffer, even though the idea of ethics and what you do in certain situations can be, um, can be very theoretical on a lot of occasions. So he repudiates the idea that ethics is just concerned with good and evil. He rejects the questions, how can I be good and how can I do good, but instead ask, what is the will of God? Um, the uh, God incarnate, crucified, and resurrected in Jesus Christ is the ultimate reality for him. And he argues that Christian ethics is about the formation of human life into the form of Christ. So he's asking, what is it to act responsibly um, for both nation and church? As I said last week, he had to weigh the option of being faithful to his nation and seeing it bring about the end of civilization or being faithful to what he saw as the call of Christ and being a traitor to his nation, saving civilization but bringing about the end of his country. So he had to weigh these, these different options ethically. And he saw that acting on behalf of others in accordance with reality and being willing to accept guilt. So again, in, in this assassination plot against Hitler, he had to say, I am willingly taking this guilt upon myself. I believe even though the right thing is to kill Hitler, I still believe it is a sin. And so he's freely taking on that guilt. Um, doing the will of God is finally rooted in the grace of God. So he, again, is throwing himself at the grace of God in the midst of that. So again, it's not about good and evil. It's about becoming like Christ. Um, no one can know the absolute goodness of his or her actions. There's always some in unintended consequence of our actions. However, we can know if we are in relationship with God and Christ. And that is the goal rather than being what we view as good. Um, it's not, ethics is not developing a list of rules, but discerning the will of God in each situation and doing that. Union with God compels us to act in love, and love is found in Jesus. And the will of God is only found by being reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. So he views the incarnation of Jesus as the place where formation happens. And the crucified Christ, the Christ who is seen as a failure in the eyes of the world, uh, it challenges a world based on the idea of success. Um, that is why the arraigners of history never cease to complain that all success comes of wickedness. So he's arguing against the Enlightenment. The forces of rationalism, nationalism, and technology cannot be turned back, but can be a turning back to Christ through confession of our guilt. This confession is absolutely essential for the church, lest she lose her identity and true nature forever. So th I mean, this is saying the church must confess itself of the church's own sin, not just of individual personal sin. Again, reflecting on the role of the church's failure to act in the midst of the Holocaust. So, God's mandates are different than ethical precepts because they focus on life as it is lived, not what is allowed. God's commandment, the commandment of God is permission to live as man before God. Um, 
their specific commands always to some other person, to concrete situations and circumstances. It is not theoretical for Bonhoeffer. Um, and the mandates of work, family, church, and the state cannot be isolated from each other or treated in isolation. So the actions of the church have an effect on the state, and the actions of the state have an effect on the church. Um, and if we view our work as a vocation, obviously that affects our role in the church. Commandments of God in the church are realized through preaching and church discipline. The church proclaims Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of the Father for all eternity, Jesus the crucified reconciler, and Jesus Christ the risen and ascended Lord. Should we ever expect a catechism for people of other religions? Um, he does. So uh, in 33, he wrote, um, I forget the exact title, but something like a, a, something like called Addressing the Jewish Question of what is the church's role in, um, in response to uh, people of the Jewish faith. Um, and he's also writing from a perspective of at that time, you know, according to the Nazi ideology of if you had at least one grandparent who was Jewish, then you were Jewish. Uh, there were pastors in the church who qualified for that. So he's writing from that perspective as well. Um, but also, he wanted to study with Gandhi. Um, and he exchanged a couple of letters with Gandhi, and Gandhi invited him to his ashram to either study with him or one of his teachers. Um, he was very interested in nonviolence and pacifism after his time in New York, um, but that never actually happened. But he doesn't really talk about Buddhism or Hinduism as such. Um, you think he would stay with people for trying to follow the will of God, whether they profess Christ or not, was not the most important thing? Mm, I mean, Christ is pretty central to his, his theology, so um, I, think, I think he would probably say that there's no rev revelation outside of Christ, um, but he was certainly willing to be in relationship with people of other faiths. So his theology may have been um, narrow in that sense, but um, in terms of how he viewed salvation and redemption and reconciliation, um, but he wasn't shutting himself off from people of other faiths, if that makes sense. But uh, it's, it's a very good question, especially in light of everything he says. Um, but you also have to remember he's, he's writing from a culture that uh, is pretty much only <coughs> Christian and Jewish. So his, his exposure, his experience of other religions is pretty limited. Um, Political action means taking on responsibility. This cannot happen without power, and power is to serve responsibly. I really like this one. The task of pastoral ministry above all else is to arrange contingencies for an encounter with the divine. Do and dare what is right, not swayed by the whim of the moment. Bravely take hold of the real, not dallying now with what might be, not in the flight of ideas, but only in action <coughs> is freedom. Make up your mind and come out into the tempest of living. God's command is enough, and your faith in him to sustain you. Then at last, freedom will welcome your spirit amid great rejoicing. The figure of the crucified invalidates all thought which takes success for its standard. The Christian life is participation in the encounter of Christ with the world. So uh, his last writing that we have. So letters and papers from prison uh, were written from his arrest in April of 1943 
to February of 1945 is when we have his last letter. Um, that is when he was transferred to, um, to the concentration camps. So he, he was in prisons, um, Prince Albert Strasse prison in Berlin, where uh, he was able to write letters to his parents and his fiance and his friends. Uh, and they were able to bring him books and things. Um, so once he gets transferred elsewhere, that's when those stop. Um, so he dies three months after the last letter we have from him. So again, his friend, Eberhard Betka, uh, who many of the letters were addressed to, gathered the letters that Dietrich had sent him and to his parents uh, and some others um, and, and put them together in this book. And, and Betka really thought several years about, oh, do I publish this? Is this going to be of interest to other people or not? And it's the publishing of this book that really uh, introduces the world to who Bonhoeffer was um, to his story. It also includes poems, uh, which you have three of the better ones in there. It's got um, some fragmentary theological work. Um, there's a play. Um, there's a bunch of different things in it. But uh, so he writes this uh, the day after the failed assassination attempt. The church is the church only when it exists for others. The church must share in the sec secular problems of ordinary human life, not dominating, but helping and serving. So at the end of 43, he writes uh, this long document called After 10 Years. So reflecting on 10 years of Hitler being in power. He says, Christ kept himself from suffering till his hour had come, but when it did come, he met it as a free man and mastered it. Christ, so the scriptures tell us, bore the sufferings of all humanity in his own body as if they were his own, a thought beyond our comprehension, accepting them of his own free will. We are certainly not Christ. We are not called to redeem by our own deeds and sufferings, and we need not try to assume such an impossible burden. We are not lords, but instruments in the hand of the Lord of history. And we can share in other people's sufferings only to a very limited degree. We are not Christ, but if we want to be Christians, we must have some share in Christ's large-heartedness by acting with responsibility and in freedom when the hour of danger comes. And by showing a real sympathy that springs not from fear, but from the liberating and redeeming love of Christ for all who suffer. Mere waiting and looking on is not Christian behavior. The Christian is called to sympathy and actions, not in the first place by his own suffering, but by the sufferings of his brethren for, the sake, for whose sake Christ suffered. This is also from that same document. We have been silent witnesses of evil deeds. Many storms have gone over our heads. We have learned the art of deception and of equivocal speech. Experience has made us suspicious of others and prevented us from being open and frank. Bitter conflicts have made us weary and even cynical. Are we still of any use? It is not the genius that we shall need, not the cynic, not the misanthropist, not the adroit tactician, but honest, straightforward men. Will our spiritual reserves prove adequate in our candor with ourselves, remorseless enough to enable us to find our way back to simplicity and straightforwardness? So this is the first letter we have to his parents. This is about a week after he's in prison. Um, and in this letter, he's, he's really deflecting. He, he wants to reassure his parents that he's, he's okay. Um, my dear parents, I do want you to be quite sure that I'm all right. I'm sorry that this is the first time I've been allowed to write to you. It was quite out of the question during the first 10 days. To my surprise, the discomforts you usually associate with prison life, such as physical hardships, don't seem to trouble me at all. In the prison courtyard, there is a thrush 
which sings a beautiful little song every morning, and now he has started in the evening too. One is grateful for the little things, and that also is, again, goodbye for now. Uh, this is from 44. Um, so he's been in prison over a year when he writes this. My thoughts and feelings seem to be getting more and more like the Old Testament, and no wonder I've been reading it much more than the New for the last few months. It is only when one knows the ineffability of the name of God that one can utter the name of Jesus Christ. It is only when one loves life and the world so much that without them everything would be gone that one can believe in the resurrection and a new world. It is only when one submits to the law that one can speak of grace, and only when one sees the anger and wrath of God hanging like grim realities over the head of one's enemies that one can know something of what it means to love them and forgive them. So this is his last letter to his parents. Um, he dies about four months later, um, and his parents, as I said last week, don't find out until July. So this is the last they hear of their son. Dear parents, the last two years have taught me how little we can get along with, but every day thousands are losing all they have. And when we remember that, we know that we have no right to call anything our own. Is H.W. really fine in the East and R's husband? Many thanks for your letter. I read all my letters though until through until I know them by heart. Now a few requests. I was disappointed not to receive any books today. <laughs> Commissar Sonderager would quite willingly accept them every now and then. I would be most grateful. Also, there were no matches, face cloths, or towels this time. Pardon my mentioning the subject, otherwise everything was wonderful. Can I please have some toothpaste and a few coffee beans? And dear Papa, from the library, Lean Hard and Abendstunden eines Einsiedlers by H. Pestalozzi, Social Pedagogy by P. Notwerp, and The Lives of Great Men by Plutarch. <coughs> I'm getting on all right. Take care of yourselves once more. Thank you for everything. With fondest love, your grateful Dietrich. So, um, religionless Christianity, which is what your handout deals with, in his later letters to Eberhard Becca, he's thinking about this concept of Christianity without religion. He talks about this world come of age with its technology that is, uh, has less and less of a need for religion in the world. And he's trying to envision a Christianity for people who are not religious. He says, uh, if we do not want to do this, if we had finally to put down the Western pattern of Christianity, as a mere preliminary stage to doing without religion altogether, what situation would result for us, for the church? How can Christ become the Lord even of those with no religion? If religion is no more than the garment of Christianity, even that garment has had very different aspects at different periods, then what is religionless Christianity? The time when people could be told everything by means of words, whether theological or pious, is over, and so is the time of inwardness and conscience. And that means the time of religion in general. We are moving towards a completely religionless time. People as they are simply cannot be religious anymore. And a little bit more explanation of it. Um, so part of what this is coming from is, as I mentioned before, his teachers, uh, the, these German liberal theologians, greatly supported World War I. Dietrich saw his 18-year-old brother lose his life in World War I. Um, you see all of these men coming back from the war without limbs, uh, the Kaiser abdicates. You're, you go through 
15 years of a failed republic. Um, and so there is this, uh, the church has lost its authority. Um, to many in society, uh, the church went so willingly into this war, they have lost um, this, this sense of authority in the society. And so Bonhoeffer is going through this again and so he's, he's reflecting on it um, from, from that perspective. So according to him, the church has failed in its mission to the modern world because it was not able to separate the message of Christ from religious trappings. And the church used God as this deus ex machina, a God of the gaps that filled in the holes of our knowledge. And he sees secularism increasingly permeating the lives of modern people, uh, and God being pushed further away into irrelevance. So the purpose of finding a non-religious interpretation of Christianity was to allow the gospel to address humans in a secular age without them having to become religious, without having to take on the different trappings of religion. So it's a consistent development from his earlier thought. When he says religionless, he doesn't, he does not mean Christless or godless, but his Christology remains central to this religionless interpretation of Christianity. He, see, he sees Christ as being able to reach beyond these concepts and trappings of traditional religion. Uh, and meeting people where they are in the common day because that is what Jesus did in his life. Uh, and, and, and there's more context in your handout if you want to read more about that. So um, I read with you the Who Am I poem uh, last week, um, which Bonhoeffer writes about himself. Uh, and we've read by gracious powers together before. Um, this is a poem called The Death of Moses. Uh, and I think uh, this is, is the one that is, re for me, is um, the most touching and speaks the most to Bonhoeffer's life indirectly. And the Lord showed him all the land upon the mountain summit stands at last Moses, the prophet, the man of God. Unwavering, his eyes look on the view, survey the promise scene, the holy land. Now, Lord, thy promises have been fulfilled. To me, thy word has been forever sure. Deliverance and salvation are thy gifts. Thy anger chastens, casts away, consumes. Eternal, faithful Lord, thy faithless slave knows well. At all times, righteous is thy will. So today inflict my punishment and fold me in the long, dark sleep of death. Rich grow the vineyards in the holy land. Faith only knows the promise of their wine. Pour for the doubter then his bitter draught, and let his faith proclaim thy thanks and praise. Wondrous the works which thou hast done by me, changing my cup from gall to sweet delight. Grant me to witness through the veil of death my people with their high triumphant feast. I fail and sink in thine eternity, but see my people marching forward free. God who punishes sin and willingly forgives, I have loved this people. But I have carried its shame and burdens and seen its salvation. That is enough. Seize me, hold me, my staff is sinking. Faithful God, prepare my grave. So, I mean, Bonhoeffer knows his end is coming, um, and he's, he's really reflecting on that here. So finally, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die, death in Jesus Christ, the death of the old man at his call. Jesus summons to the rich young man who was calling to him because only the man who is dead to his own will. Questions? <laughs> that is the densest of all of our sessions.
Um, next week, we're going to be talking about Bonhoeffer's legacy and what uh, he means for us today. Uh, we'll be looking at um, a video from Reggie Williams, who's an African-American theologian who deals with Bonhoeffer's work and other folks and um, you know, what it means uh, for the times we're living in. Saying, I think we're going to approach it that kind of stuck with me through my entire ministry and somehow I feel like it's relating to all the things that Bonhoeffer was saying. And I don't know who said this originally, it may have been him, but it, it, it's um, the sign of God is that you will be loved where you did not claim to go. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's kind of the thing of not your will, but what God wants yeah. and it's probably not what you would naturally maybe because sometimes we have to step out and do things that are uncomfortable mm-hmm. in order for God's grace to move on us. Yeah, and you see it over and over um, in his life. Um, he goes to London to escape the situation and feels drawn back. He goes to New York and feels drawn back and there's this continuous pull um, and not what was comfortable. No, <laughs> absolutely not. I mean, I certainly don't think leading an illegal seminary and leading these small groups of churches and everything and um, becoming a double agent were not, were not in his plan. I think mm-hmm. had it been up to Bonhoeffer, he would have been teaching at Berlin for 40 years um, and ended up like one of those great old white bearded men of theology that he studied under but was called to something different it's improbable if he'd done that we might not have heard of him well yeah I was I was thinking about that this week you know um, as I was looking at at all of his writings you know what would we have gotten for 40 more years and what would have he become we certainly wouldn't know him in the way we know him now as as this kind of great man of faith who follows against all odds and uh, a martyr, um, there'd, there'd probably just be people in seminaries who, who know his name. And, and his theology really didn't become important until um, after the letters and papers in prison became published and people became, came to know about his personal story and then became interested in, in what he had to say. Yeah, exactly. Then it takes on a different meaning. I was really struck by a comment a video that he previously had written when he wrote in the 1930s and 40s and how relevant they are and yeah. parallel to the, to the world we now live in. And it's just sort of like, what is, what is my call? Now? Yeah, yeah. Sojourners had an article, Sojourners of Progressive Christian Magazine, and they had an article last year um, called, Is This a Bonhoeffer Moment? Um, <laughs> is this a moment for people with, with that voice? And um, we'll talk about that next week. <laughs> Great. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Yeah, so, so when I was um, in Germany for a Peace and Justice Integrity Creation Seminar in 88, a South African couple, missionary couple, was coming through, and they stopped and talked to our group. And what I distinctly remember the most about that whole time is they said to us, because this was when apartheid was still going on, every day it cost us our lives to work for peace and justice. Yeah. What does it cost you, and what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and there's, uh, there's uh, this South African stream of interpretation on Bonhoeffer out of the experience of apartheid. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I have a book to recycle.